This is a, um, a review session for the exam, which is on Friday. Um, so please, uh, at any point, um, let me know if you have questions. Um, and I can answer those. Um, so you can feel free to, to interrupt. I, I do have some stuff ready to talk about. Um, so we can start with that. I'll be posting, so uh, there's a practice, uh, hopefully you already saw the practice, uh, free response problem, which is uh, available on Blackboard um, from last week's um, week uh, link. And I'll be posting today, uh, practice multiple choice. Um, just to just to give you a, a heads up for for since you're here, um, you probably want to know a little bit about the exam. I, I'm changing the format slightly uh, to reflect um, the realities of of uh, taking it remotely. So the the big thing is that it's going to be um, open note, open book, um, because it's just not worth it for me to try and police that and and to you know, I mean, there are ways to do it and make you turn on your webcam and stuff like that. And I, I don't think that's a fair thing to do that you didn't sign up for at the beginning of the semester. So uh, the difference is there, there'll be um, the multiple choice questions will also have, uh, so th there'll be five multiple choice questions and then there'll be a question after that, which is basically explain your answer to this question. So that uh, you'll need to you know, have an explanation there for full credit, but also it means that even if you got the multiple choice part wrong, if you get some parts of the explanation correct, you can get, uh, it allows for partial credit uh, on, the, on the multiple choice. And then the, uh, the free response, also I'm going to structure it a little bit more um, just so that, um, you know, that I point out you know, a lot of people do a good job anyway of explaining their steps, um, but I'm, I'm going to make it a little bit more structured so that it says, okay, now, you know, rather than just me following your math, you know, say, okay, in this part I used, you know, conservation of energy, or uh, I defined my system this way, so energy is conserved, or, you know, I had to calculate the work done by friction, um, and that decreased the energy of the system. So, It'll be, you know, it won't just be a problem where I say, now explain what you did. It's going to be a little bit more like, um, okay, on this part, set up this equation and tell me what concept you're applying, right? Or what conservation law or, or things like that. Um, and then the, the algebra part, you just need to show your algebra work as, as usual. Um, so if you have questions, you can, you know, feel free to, um, you know, unmute yourself to, um, to ask them, or you can uh, type them in the chat, and I, I'll be able to see. Um, so let me, I'm going to go ahead and share um, my screen here for my little whiteboard. Okay. So Um, okay, so just a, a kind of a big picture overview, what um, what's on this exam? We have we started out with work and its relationship to um, kinetic energy. Now, we later saw that um, if, if external work is done on a system, it changes the total energy of that system, right? So I'm, I'm gonna write it as work and energy, not just kinetic energy, um, because you have cases where you know, there's other types of energy involved, but you still have to, to do work, uh, use work as a concept. So the, the definition, is work is equal to force. Um, I'll write the cosine theta here times displacement. 
right, where the um, F cosine theta tells you that it's only the component of the, the force that points in the direction of the displacement or completely opposite to the direction of displacement that uh, does any work. So um, what you can do is if you, have a, if you have a force that's not purely in the direction of motion, you just break it into components and say, okay, well, I'm just gonna use the horizontal component because the object's moving horizontally. Uh, it doesn't, if it doesn't move vertically, then you don't have to worry about, there's no work done in that direction because it's not moving in that direction. Um, now the, so, uh, on, you know, we definitely had homework problems where you did have to do those um, components and, and breaking those apart. So, so that's something that you should uh, be prepared for in a, um, especially in a uh, multiple choice type question. Um, but a, a, a lot of cases we have a force that you know is is automatically either aligned or anti-aligned. Anti-aligned is the physics term for pointing in the opposite direction um, to the displacement. So the the important thing here is that um, if if the force and direct and displacement are the same same direction. That means that the work is positive. And if they are uh, opposite direction, then the work is negative. So I can pretty much guarantee you that on the um, on the exam there will be a multiple choice question that involves um, looking at work and is the work done by this force positive or negative or is this uh, the total work positive or negative, right? So we can, um, you know, so if we if we want to look at an example here. of a um, multiple choice type question. Um, let me see. Let's say, uh, okay, so we've got a, a horizontal surface. Let me draw my uh, object here. I won't try and get too fancy with the picture. So we just have an object and then we've got a, um, pushing force, All right, let's say to the right, and the object has a displacement to the right, and there is a force of friction. So I'll just write mu is, uh, mu sub k is not zero. All right, so we're not gonna do a calculation here, we're just uh, looking at conceptual. So, um, you know, if if I wanted to ask three different, uh, so, and then let me just say, um, okay, you're pushing to the right, there's friction, and the block is slowing down. Okay, so I want to give you uh, a second here to um, just, I just want to know positive, negative, or zero. So, um, we can say the work done by the pushing force, is that positive, negative, or zero? The work done by friction, is that positive, negative, or zero? And then the net work or total work, is that positive, negative, or zero? All right, so hopefully that pause for the sip of coffee gives you uh, a second to go through those three things. So the uh, the work done by the pushing force, we can do just based on the definition of work, 
All right, so the pushing force is horizontal. It's in the direction of the displacement. So that's going to be positive, right? And you know, I, I think I put on a bunch of these um, homework, multiple choice questions, or and maybe on the quiz, um, an option where, oh, you have to know the direction of, of the axes to know whether it's going to be positive or negative. That's not true for, for work and energy. Work and energy are not vectors, right? They're scalars. So positive and negative is something that we should all agree on, right? So even if we both, if if I call positive being to the right and you call positive being to the left, we'll both say that the pushing force and the and the displacement are in the same direction. So we should say that the work is positive. Uh, now we, I didn't draw the the force of friction on here, but you could put it in, right? Because the block is moving to the right. I said that aloud, but I didn't write it down. Well, okay, yeah, I did. Uh, I said the displacement's to the right. So <clears throat> that means the force of friction is to the left. And so that means that uh, by, by the definition of work, the work done by friction is negative. Now, um, that's always going to be true for friction, right? At least kin kinetic friction. The, you, know, you could think of a kind of a counter example like an object that's sitting on a conveyor belt, right? Where, yes, there's technically static friction that's moving it, but you know we don't we didn't really talk about that. So <clears throat> the work done by kinetic friction is is always negative because the force of kinetic friction points opposite to the direction that the object moves. Um, okay, so now now the question that we have to um, ask is the network. Now, if we knew the magnitudes of these forces, right? If I told you that the work or that the pushing force was, you know, if I gave you a value for that and I gave you a value from you and the mass of the object, you'd be able to calculate and figure out what the net force is, right? But I didn't give you that. What did I give you? I gave that the block is slowing down, right? So in this picture, the only option for your system to make is just the block, right? There, it's not changing height, so we don't have to worry about potential energy of gravity. There's no spring involved. Right, so it's just the block. So all we can say is, well, is the energy of the block increasing or decreasing? And the only kind of energy that it can have is kinetic energy. So because it's slowing down, we know that its energy is decreasing. Right, so this is where we bring in the, the work um, energy theorem, which is that work is equal to the change. Well, I, I guess we could write work external which is just kind of, to me, it's kind of redundant. You would ne you never talk about work within a system, but it helps us remember, okay, I should be looking for forces that are outside of my system. Uh, so the, the external work is equal to the change in energy of the system. Right, so that means in this case that the network, because the change in energy is negative, the network is negative. Right, so that's the only way that I, you know, so I can say now, well, okay, that must mean that the force of friction is bigger in magnitude than the uh, pushing force, right? Because it's, you know, I'm pushing it to the right, but it's uh, it's slowing down. Okay, so, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I know that I had on some assignment or another, um, whether as a, homework or the quiz, probably I think parts on both. Um, you know, there was an elevator problem. So you can think of every combination, right, of, you know, the forces in different directions. So in that case, there was a cable pulling up on the elevator. And of course, there's gravity pulling down on the elevator. And I say, okay, uh, if the elevator's uh, moving, I don't remember which combination I picked, but you could pick moving up and slowing down, moving up and speeding up, moving up at a constant velocity, and then the other three, right? Moving down, slowing down, moving down, speeding up, and moving down at a constant velocity. Right? And each of these those three cases, or you could do it something here like a pushing force and a uh, force of friction, you know, uh, a pushing force and a spring, um, spring and gravity, right? All those different combinations, um, which works are positive, which works are negative, and then based on whether the object is speeding up or slowing down, you can you can compare uh, and say what the overall network is by by using the work energy theorem. 
okay so um like I said, the, the the reason why you can definitely expect work on the multiple choice part of the exam is because on the free response part of the exam, it's kind of up to you. Um, there, I mean, there will definitely be energy involved in the problem on the free response free response part, um, but you can define your system. So therefore, you can decide whether um, you're going to use work or not. And most people probably will opt not to use work whenever they can use conservation of energy. So I'm definitely gonna put it on the, put work on the multiple choice part so that I make sure that that, that part gets, uh, that concept gets tested. All right, so then um, uh, if we go uh, beyond the, uh, um, The work energy theorem. Right now, if we if we define systems, right? So let me I'm gonna draw a line across here. Not that. All right. So if we if we define systems, then we can talk about potential energy and use conservation of energy. So systems, potential energy, and energy conservation. Okay, so we've got kinetic energy, which which I um, was included in the problem or the the situation above, but we didn't actually calculate it, right? So we have kinetic energy, one half mv squared. And then we've got the other types of um, potential energy that we're dealing with in this class. So that's potential energy due to gravity, which is mass times g times h, and then potential energy of a spring, which is one half k x squared. All right, so um, yeah, I, I think that uh, you know in any in any problem you might have kinetic energy, although a lot of times um, in our in our problems that we're, that we're doing, we're many in many cases we're looking for where that uh, kinetic energy is equal to zero. Yeah. So, um, in principle, it's always there. It's just zero a lot of times. I'm looking for Ke equals zero. In uh, lot of problems. All right, so um, you have, for instance, like when a, an object starts at rest or we're looking for the maximum height that something gets to or the maximum amount that a spring is compressed, right? Whenever you hear those terms like I mean, it, this goes back to talking about kin kinematics, right? When we were saying, well, what's the maximum height that an object gets to or, or where does it turn around, right? That's the, the key word that you should hear or read and, and think um, velocity equals zero, right? And so in this case, velocity equals zero would be kinetic energy is equal to zero. Um, now, uh, where, where things are zero is often very important in physics. So for uh, potential energy due to gravity, um, we have to define our height equals zero. Oops. Right, and so that's just, you know, your reference point um, that where you're measuring everything from. Um, so, you can define it however you want. A lot of times there'll be sort of an obvious um, 
point that presents itself, but you don't have to follow follow that along. It's just going to probably make your life easier if you do, um, you know, make the lowest point in the problem the height equals zero. And then for the spring, um, the potential energy of the spring is equal to zero. Well, it's where x equals zero, but you have to you have to uh, de define that. So the potential energy of the spring where x equals zero, or excuse me, the point where x equals zero is um, where the spring is relaxed. All right, so that means neither stretched nor compressed. All right, so in some problems you might just it might just say that, or you might have a spring, you know, like a sort of a bed spring. Um, so I think like the um, the practice exam problem, you have a block that's moving toward a, a spring that's initially uncompressed. So where the block first hits the spring is going to be um, where that is. Let's see, I've got a question in the chat. Uh, yeah, that, so that could also be called equilibrium um, because that would be um, the point where where forces are balanced. So that's um, so especially like if you have a, a, an object hanging from a spring. Right, that the equilibrium point would be like if you just let it go, it would it would um, that would be the point where it would just stay still. So it it, it yeah, it is also called equilibrium or the equilibrium point. Good question. Okay, um, so the the strategy for um, for problem solving. I'll move down to a new page. Uh, Any time that you have energy you want to first um, so pretty much any time in physics you're 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 relating to to uh, defined points uh, but here it's based on position as opposed to with kinematics, you have to worry about time. With it, with energy, uh, time doesn't really come up. So um, so you want to define, well, first of all, you have to define your system, right? So that you know which forces are within the system, which means that you can define a potential energy. And if there are any forces outside of the system, like a friction or um, you know, somebody pushing or pulling or like a rope pulling on something, right? So then um, you want to define your two points. So with energy problems, I often call them one and two as opposed to initial and final, um, partly because energy kind of works the same forward and backward. Uh, as long as there's no friction, you know, for instance, like a if an object, for instance, like the, uh, the example of the object hanging from a spring, right? If there were no friction or drag or anything else, then the energy would be the same when the object gets here, no matter how many times it's gone up and down. So uh, that's, that's a reason there, but you can define it initial and final if you like. Um, define, so you wanna define points one and two. Um, and then you wanna say, well, E1 equals, well, I mean, we can just write it out. It's always going to be kinetic energy plus potential energy from the spring plus potential energy from the gra uh, from gravity if those things are present, right? So, you know, you might just want to write it down the same, uh, I guess I've, here, uh, well, okay. So you would write E1 equals that and decide, you know, are any of them equal to zero? Um, what's our what's our given information? E two equals you know you've got the same options right so right so once you've defi decided whether any of them are equal to zero you can put in your mghs and your one half kx squareds and stuff um, but then the important thing that you always need to need to check is whether there's any external work so 
rather than just assuming that there's going to be energy conservation, I always just like to write external work is equal to the change in energy, which you can write as E2 minus E1. I guess in this case, final minus initial might, uh, you know, I'm just in the habit of using one and two, uh, especially because a lot of times in uh, energy problems, you might have a third point, right? So you can have the, uh, what was the, the homework problem, you know, uh, person pushes a ball down on a spring. I think I still assigned this one. A uh, person pushes the ball down on a spring um, and then the ball leaves the spring. How fast is it going at that point? And then how high does it get from there? Uh, so that's three different points you have to look at. You just break it into multiple problems. Um, okay, so the the external work is equal to E2 minus E1. So in that case, you have to figure out, is there any external work? Is there friction? Or is there you know somebody pushing or pulling on the, on the system? Um, and then you, um, if, if there is, you have to calculate what that work is. And then you've got a, an equation which will let you solve for whatever uh, whatever you're looking for. Now, if the external work is zero, all that means is that E2 is equal to E1 and you do have energy conservation, right? So um, it's just a, a good point to check. And then you, then you solve at this point. Solve algebra, whatever kind of algebra uh, you have. Okay. Uh, so that's that's the problem solving strategy for whenever using um, energy, energy conservation, or you know even if there's external work. So then the the last major concept is uh, momentum conservation. We're we're pretty much apart from from I think a single homework problem which wanted you to relate momentum to an average force. We're pretty much using momentum conservation in um, collisions or explosions um, to figure out, you know, relate initial and final velocities. All right, so um, for momentum, the equations are super simple. We just have momentum, which is P is equal to the mass of the object times its velocity. And then conservation, says that momentum initial is equal to momentum final, and you have to consider that it's a vector. So um, you know, if it's one dimensional, which you know, I'm not gonna throw any curveballs at you in the exam with a two dimensional. So <laughs> it will be one dimensional on the exam. You just have to make sure that you take into account uh, positive and uh, negative to get the directions right. Um, and then we have uh, collision types, which are elastic and inelastic. So elastic, that means that K, uh, kinetic energy is also conserved. And inelastic, well, uh, kinetic energy is not conserved. So I think um, so that means I mean the energy doesn't just vanish; it goes into something else, which is usually like you can think of like deforming the object or into sound or heat, uh, right? So inelastic, uh, the kinetic energy is not conserved. Um, so I think we can uh, we can break this down even farther and say, well, if it's an inelastic collision, meaning two things that start apart and then run into each other, we can say that kinetic energy uh, decreases. Right, that's always going to be the case. And then if we have an explosion, right, and using that term again loosely, so. You can have an explosion that is an actual thing blowing up, or you know, um, 
two people standing on an ice rink and pushing off from each other. Um, as long as, you know, they're starting quote unquote stuck together or moving together and then push away from each other, we can call that an explosion. And so that means, well, think about, think about the kinetic energy of two people standing next to each other and then pushing off of each other, right? There, there's some work that's being put into the system. And so uh, the kinetic energy of the system is in that case is going to increase. All right, so if you have an elastic collision, all you need to know is the masses and the initial velocities. And in principle, you know, as long as you can solve the algebra, then you can, um, you can solve for the final velocities. Now the algebra sometimes gets messy. I'm not gonna make anything where the algebra gets too messy to be on the exam. Um, because, you know, as you've seen, the, the algebra uh, working out is, is a small fraction of points. So I don't wanna make that like the main thing that you have to work on on the exam. The main thing that you should work on should be the physics. Um, so in an inelastic collision, you have to either, you have to either be told the final velocity of one of the objects, right? So in some cases you might be told, well, one of the objects stops or something like that. Um, or what often uh, happens is you have a perfectly inelastic collision where, um, the two objects are um, stuck together after the the the, uh, the collision. Now, I guess you could say a perfectly inelastic explosion would be a similar sort of thing. What well, that's always, I mean, there. Are, I'm only defining explosion if the things are stuck together or moving together um, before uh, whatever sort of explosion happens. So in that case, you know, you start with zero momentum. So you have to end with zero momentum. So one's gonna have positive, whatever the value is, and the other one's gonna have negative. Um, so I guess in that case, you do have to be told, um, yeah, you would have to be told in that case, you know, okay, uh, you know, you and a sumo wrestler are standing on ice and, and you push off from each other and, you know, who's moving faster, right? I mean, that could be a conceptual question, right? So the person who's more massive is gonna move slower uh, because they have to have the same momentum. Okay, um, now I see just as a um, sort of uh, warning, I see every year on this exam um, when when there's a collision, I guess people get so, so set in, um, thinking about energy conservation, they forget which, they, they kind of lose sight of momentum, right? So momentum is always conserved in a collision, right? So if you have a collision, you have to use momentum, right? So I, I see every year people just uh, see an inelastic collision and they forget which one do you keep and which one do you throw away? Uh, now maybe this, that won't be as much of an issue with an open notes exam, but that's something you should put in your notes, right? Collision. Momentum is always conserved. Sometimes, if you're told it's elastic, the kinetic energy is also conserved. Okay. Um, so um, at this point, if there are any questions, I can answer those now. Um, if not, I was gonna do, uh, I'll do a, um, example problems similar to um, the type of free response problem you can expect for the exam. Okay, so I, I don't see any, uh, there you go, yeah, okay, nobody's, chatting or raising their hand. So I'll go ahead and, uh, and, and do this example problem. Now, um, so, okay, so, well, to kind of cut to the chase, the type of example problem that you should expect for the, uh, or sorry, the type of uh, free response problem you should expect is um, a problem that combines 
energy and momentum. So we've seen a few of these. Um, so one was the example video, um, and I, I also I had my uh, my example written out uh, of the ballistic pendulum, right? Um, so that was the case where you, where you were trying to figure out the velocity of a bullet because uh, by shooting it into a block, and then the blocks on a pendulum, and you see how high the pendulum goes. Um, the there was a homework problem where you had a bullet that was fired into a block that then runs into a spring. Very similar um, sort of situation in that case. You have um, a collision where you have to use momentum, and then you have energy uh, at, at conservation as the um, block collides with the or compresses the spring. Um, and then the the, the practice problem. Um, for the, the practice free response problem is is also quite similar to that, um, except in that case it's two blocks which become stuck together. Okay, so um, my example here that I want to do is we've got a sledding hill, very steep one apparently, um, and we've got three identical triplets. Oops, let me zoom in so that I can actually draw. Um, so one of whom is in a sled up here, and the other two are in a sled down here. So I said identical triplets just so that we can say that they all have the same mass. All right, so, and we can uh, basically uh, neglect the mass of the sled, so we're gonna have mass up here m and then mass down here 2m um let's see i, I should put a, a height of the hill is uh 15 meters and then we're gonna have no friction in uh in the main part of the hill, so we can say it's like pretty icy there, and then they run into a, a region where there's um, a lot of grass or something. Uh, so here there's going to be a coefficient of friction mu sub k is equal to um, 0 0.4. That's not legible. Let me Well, one more try, sorry. 0 0.4. Okay. Um, so then uh, the question that we have, oh, and, and so um, the twin that's up here is going to sled down and collide, and then they will um, grab onto each other's sled so we can say that they stick together. And the question that we have is how far into the grass do they go before stopping? Okay, so I said I was going to make this like the exam problem. Um, the exam problem would be a little bit more structured, right? So I, I would probably ask, um, and this is the way that, that we can break it down, right? How fast is the, the child going at the bottom of the hill? How fast would they all be going right after the collision? And then how far do they get into the, um, into the grass? So, um, well, I'll go ahead and um, set it up that way. Um, so 
So even though I, I wrote only, I don't want to hand write all these questions just because it's taking a while to, for me to write it out, but I'll, I'll do it step by step that way. All right, so we're going to have, um, oh, I guess one more thing that I should say is that the, the kid up top does not get a running start, so that's velocity is equal to zero. Just kind of nudges his way over the um, over the edge. Okay, so um, we can first say um, v at bottom of the hill. All right, so this is energy conservation, right? Um, so I'm going to define my system here to uh, to be the child. Uh, plus earth. So then I can say, well, okay, let me go ahead and, and label these points. I got point one there and then point two here. Right, so then I can say E1. Oh, well, I need to define where is my height equal to zero. I kind of implicitly did that by saying that the that the height was equal to 15 up at the top, but it's always good to be very explicit. So I'll call my height equal zero at the bottom. Right, so E1 then. Um, is going to be, well, just for completeness, I'll write out kinetic energy plus potential energy due to gravity, but kinetic energy is zero because we start with zero velocity. So then that's going to be just potential energy due to gravity, which is mgh. And then E2 at the bottom. I could have kinetic energy and I could have potential energy due to gravity. And I've left out the potential energy due to spring. I, I know I said you could write that in every one, but there's no spring here. So just felt like redundant writing. Um, so at the bottom, I've got potential energy due to gravity is, is equal to zero. So I can cross that out. So then the total energy is just going to be one half mv squared. For completeness, I will say uh, the work external is equal to zero. So that's equal to the change in energy. So that means that E2 equals E1. Right, so because I've defined my system to include the, the child and the earth, uh, there's no outside forces that I've neglected that are that are going to do any work. Now there's a normal force from the from the hill, but normal force doesn't do any work uh, unless the surface is moving, like in an elevator. So um, there's no work done there, um, and there's no friction in this part of the hill. So uh, E2 is equal to E1. So I can just write down what I have above. So that's one half m v. I guess because I'm going to have multiple velocities here, I should probably label that. I'll call that V2, right? Because I called that point two. One half mv2 squared is equal to mgh. And then mass cancels out. So I can go ahead and, and do that. And let's see. Um, I'm trying to solve for the velocity, so I multiply by 2 and take the square root. So I've got V2 is equal to um, square root of 2GH. All right, so if I want to get a number, which I would if I was, you know, somebody was asking me this. Um, let's see. So I've got square root of 2 times 9.8 meters per second squared times 15 meters. I can see that's going to give me, underneath the square root sign, meters squared per second squared. And when I take the square root, that's a velocity. So um, that's good. Um, so I've got square root of 2 times 9.8 times 15, which gives me a velocity, wow, steep hill. Um, well, tall hill, no friction. Uh, I get 17.1 meters per second. It's like 34 miles an hour.
not the safest sledding hill and probably shouldn't be like crashing into your siblings at the bottom of it but you know I'm sure many of us did stuff that dumb as kids so okay so that's the velocity at the bottom of the hill now the next question is what's the velocity um after the collision Right, so the fact that it's a collision should tell you that um, that you should use momentum. Right, so um, I'll I'll redraw here what we've got now. So okay, sled's not red anymore just because I'm too lazy to switch. So I've got the single kid cruising along at a velocity v two, and then the two kids here at a velocity of um, zero, and then they're gonna collide. And then they'll all be stuck together, right? Because one grabbed on, there's a hand grabbing the sled. Um, and so I wanna look for what I'll call here the final velocity. It's the velocity after the collision. Of course, the final velocity when they get in the grass is gonna be zero, but. Okay, so that's what I want to know. Final velocity is equal to question mark. So my initial momentum is just going to be the mass of a single child times V2. Right, because the velocity of the, the two kids in the slide is zero. And then the final velocity, or sorry, the final momentum is going to be well, now I have three kids all together moving, you know, they're, they're stuck together, so I can treat them as a single object, which I think for a, a lot of people is the easiest way to do these perfectly inelastic collisions. Think of it now as a single object, right, because things are stuck together, right? So rather than, you know, for instance, in the ballistic pendulum, rather than saying, well, the bullet is moving at this velocity and the block is moving at this velocity and that happens to be the same velocity, just say, well, now I've got a block bullet combo has a new mass because stuff is stuck together and it's all moving at this velocity. Anyway, so the, the kids, three, uh, three times the mass um, and uh, moving at velocity V final. And then, of course, the whole deal with momentum is that it's conserved in a collision. So I can combine these two and say that um, M times V2 is equal to 3M times v final, right, again, mass, or m cancels out, and so I'm trying to solve for v final, so I can say v final is equal to, um, just need to divide by 3, so I've got uh, v2 over 3, and I know what v2 is, I calculated that above, that's 17.1 meters per second, divide by 3, and that gives me whatever that is. Um, type that real quick. 17.1 divide by 3. 5.7 meters per second. Okay, so that's the velocity after the collision. All right, and last piece. How far do they go? Now this is a point where I have to use work, right? So, okay, I'm gonna draw a new picture. So I've got the two sleds, they're moving at velocity V final, which I know what that is. I know that the, the mass is 3M. And then after some displacement D, where mu sub K, is equal to 0 0.4. After some displacement here, they are going to have a velocity of zero. So, <clears throat> okay. Um, I've got 
two new points now. So just to avoid confusion with the part above, I'll call this three and this four. Right, so now, again, I wanna, no matter, I'm not using momentum. I know that's the case because there's no collision anymore. So I can say that here, um, E1, well, it's just gonna be kinetic energy, right? Because you're not changing heights, there's no spring, so I don't have to worry about anything else. So that kinetic energy is gonna be one half times the mass of the object, which is 3m, times the final squared, because that's the velocity at this point in the picture, the final. And then E2, well, it would just be kinetic energy. I guess I'll go ahead and write that. But that kinetic energy is zero because we're looking at how far they go before they come to a stop, which means that at that final point, the final energy is zero. OK, so clearly, those two energies cannot be the same. So there must be some external work, which you know, anytime you see friction, that's going to be the case. So the external work is going to be equal to the change in energy, which is equal to E2 minus E1. All right, and so the external work is the work done by friction. That's equal to E2, which is zero, minus E1, which is one half times 3m times V final squared. All right now, the work done by friction is going to be, it's always negative, so that's force of friction times displacement is equal to negative, okay, I'll. I'll combine these fractions now. So I've got negative 3m over 2 times Vf squared. <clears throat> All right, so to do the force of friction, we know that's going to be, let me uh, change colors real quick. I got force of friction is equal to mu sub k times the normal force. And in this case, because the, the surface is horizontal, there's no other vertical forces, the normal force is equal to the force of gravity. So I can just write mu sub k is equal to, or sorry, the force of friction is equal to mu sub k times mg, right? Because in this case, the normal force has to balance out the force of gravity. Right, I, I'm glossing over that. Um, you know, in principle, you should make your free body diagram and stuff, but we, we've spent a lot of time doing that. Um, okay, so uh, now I can replace that in the expression above. So I've got mu sub k mg times displacement. Um, you know, if I go back and look here, th these are both negative, so I can um, just drop the minus signs. Uh, so I've got mu sub k times mg times d is equal to negative 3m over 2 times v final squared. So there's a mass again on both sides, so that's good. I never told you the mass of the children, so hoping it was canceled out. Oh, I told you that we can ignore this minus sign and then I accidentally uh, put it there. It's not there. It canceled with the other side. Okay. Um, and we're trying to find the, uh, the displacement, so I just need to divide uh, both sides of this by the other stuff, which is mu sub k times g, divide that side by mu sub k times g. So that's going to give me displacement is equal to 3 times v final squared divided by 2 times mu sub k times g, which is equal to 3 times uh, v final was 5.7 meters per second. Squared divided by two times 0 0.4 times 9.8 meters per second squared. Which, let me type that in. Three times five point seven 
squared divided by 2 times 0.4 times 9.8 gives me 12.4 meters. which I can round to 12 meters. All right, so that's a problem that actually combined energy conservation, momentum conservation, and work. Um, so, um, you know, extra prepared if you are um, comfortable with doing that. There we go. Okay, um, so I, I know I went a little bit over time on that. Um, so thanks for staying with me. Um, any questions that people have at this point? You can always feel free to email me or set up a Zoom appointment for later in the week. All right, and I'll be posting both the notes and the video from this uh, later on once I get those put together. Um, so you can look for that for, for additional review. And like I said, the, the practice exam multiple choice will, will go up today. Oh, and the, <clears throat> the free response will be done through Gradescope again. Um, so uh, I'll be posting links and all those details uh, for the exam for Friday. All right, so that's that's all. Um, I guess I'll be ending if I don't see any questions here in the next five seconds.